we're now live on YouTube. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody to this meeting, uh, this virtual finance audit and risk committee meeting uh, being conducted with members and officers at various locations, communicating audio and video online. Uh, before the meeting starts, I'd like to invite the committee member and scrutiny officer to explain how proceedings will work and to confirm that members and officers are in attendance. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'll start with a roll call. Councillor Aspinwall. Yeah, present. Councillor North. Here. Councillor Collins. Yes, hello. Councillor Deacon Davies. Yes, I'm here. Councillor Derbyshire is currently absent. Councillor Ruggiero Shaka. Present. And Councillor Weeks. Present. Thank you. I also have Councillor Ian Albert, who's joining as Exec Member for Finance and IT. If you just confirm you're here. Yes, thank you, Matthew. Thank you. And Officers Ian Cooper. Here. Thank you. Ruben Ayavu. Present. Mark Chalkley. Present. Nazir Mohammed. Present. Thank you. Suresh Patel. Yep. Yeah. And Georgina uh, Chapman, who is watching proceedings. Here. Yeah. Thank you. I'll just run through proceedings as well this evening. I'll omit some information because I know members are aware of it, but the meeting is being streamed live on the Council's YouTube channel and Zoom. If the live stream fails, the meeting will adjourn. If the live stream cannot be restored within a reasonable period, then the remaining business will be considered at a time and date fixed by the chair. If the chair does not fix a date, the remaining business will be considered at the next ordinary meeting. If for any reason the meeting is not caught, an officer will notify attendees by interjecting the meeting and the meeting will adjourn immediately. Once the meeting is caught, the meeting will resume. If connection cannot be restored within a reasonable period, then the remaining business will be considered at a time and date fixed by the chair. If the chair does not fix the date, the remaining business will be considered at the next ordinary meeting. If a remote member loses connection, the chair may adjourn the meeting for a short period to enable connection to be re-established. If the chair does not adjourn the meeting, the member will be deemed to have left the meeting at the point of failure and be deemed to have returned at the point of re-establishment and only members present for the entirety of the debate are entitled to vote. Um, as per usual, please ensure your devices are muted and um, you mute your microphone uh, when you're not speaking. Rules of debate remain the same. Voting remains the same. Use the green tick for yes, red cross for no, or blue hand for abstain. And um, details of how members voted won't be kept unless a recorded vote is requested. Um, so over to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a very full agenda, so we're going to go through um, as quickly as we can with some of these other bits and pieces. Um, I've had no apologies for absence. Obviously, we do have one absence. If Has anybody received apologies by another means? I'll take that as a no. Um, and I've got no notification of any other business. Uh, my announcements, the audio recording in accordance with council policy, this meeting is being audio recorded as well as filmed. The audio recordings will be available to view on ModGov and the film recording via the NHGC YouTube channel. Members are reminded to make declarations of interest before an item. The detailed reminder about this and speaking rights is set out under the chair's announcements on the agenda that you should have received from ModGov. If this meeting is still underway at 9 p.m. and if members will wish, we will have a five minute comfort break at a time that's convenient to pause the meeting. Uh, I have no public participation. So we're going to move straight to item five, which is the SIAS annual report 2019-20. And I will pass to Mark Chalkley to present that. Thank you, Chair. Um, this agenda item should be relatively quick. Um, the report's presented mainly for information, just to demonstrate the work of SIA, the SIAS partnership over the, the course of the last year, uh, being 1920. Um, there's a couple of key things in there that I'd just like to draw your attention to. So in the opening um, introductory section, um, one paragraph in there details some changes at the, the top of our service. So um, the previous head of assurance departed at the end of um, 
at the end of March last year and has now been replaced by the former head of SIAS, Chris Wood. Um, and Chris Wood has subsequently been replaced by um, a former client audit manager, Darren Williams. Um, so that's some changes at the top of SIAS. Um, moving down that report, um, when we get to performance indicators, just to give an overview of how SIAS as a service performed um, up to the 31st of March 2020. So in terms of um, billable days, we hit 94% versus a target of 95%. And um, completed projects, we hit 89% against the target of 95%. Um, for, for North Hearts, as, as you'll remember from the June committee, um, we achieved both performance indicators at North Hearts. Um, so we were slightly ahead of the service in terms of um, delivery at North Hearts. Um, our performance indicators were impacted by um, COVID-19 in, in March. Um, so the numbers that you'll see in brackets on page 13 um, indicate the projected figures that, um, that were, uh, the, the revisions that were made to account for the impact of, of COVID-19 in the, the projects that we were unable to complete, um, which for performance indicator one uh, planned days, um, we would have delivered, we, we delivered 97% with those revisions and um, planned projects, we delivered 93% with those um, revisions. So both one, one, ex, one over the target and one slightly behind the target. Um, the other area that I'd just like to draw your attention to is on page 14. Um, the penultimate paragraph talks about the public sector internal audit standards, and there's a requirement of an external assessment to take place every five years. Um, this was due in November this year, but given the um, circumstances surrounding um, COVID-19 and our service delivery and our ability to deliver the, the service improvements we were looking to do. Um, it was agreed that this by SIAS board that this would be deferred until May 21. Um, so that will not be taking place this year. And we, we're now looking to May 21 to um, have our external assessment. Um, that's all I was planning to take you through in that report. I'm happy to take any questions on it. Um, but as I say, it's mainly for information just to demonstrate the work that SIAS has delivered across the partnership um, to the committee. That's great. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, do we have any questions or comments? Uh, Sam, Sam Collins. Thank you, Kate, uh, Chair. Um, just, uh, just looking at this um, report, it's a because it's quite got got quite a lot of graphic design in it. It's a, it's just a little bit of a. Um, take me a second to find it because you've got double page numbers as well. Um, not sure all the graphic design is necessary, but I can understand why you've done it. Uh, there's a talk about the um, the look into antisocial behaviour, which is I know it's mentioned later in, in the agenda, but that was cancelled. And the section, which I'm just thrashing around to find now that's that's meant to explain why it was cancelled it's on sorry it's on page 23 page 5 of the graphic design report um audit cancellations adjustment to planned days um it just the the decision to remove this audit was based upon dot 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 incorrect use of an ellipsis but um section a of 2.8 um yeah what, what's the rest of that sentence why why was that cancelled um, that that's the next report that I'll present. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought it was, but it's uh, questions there, so you can answer <laughs> the next bit. <laughs> um, yeah, th th we did pick that up after after we um, submitted the paper, so we'll go through that um, um, when we get to that paragraph. That's okay. Thank you, Sam. Uh, yeah, we'll pick that up when we do the progress report. Um, uh, count, uh, Councillor Weeks, Michael Weeks. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mark, in, in your uh, quick run through, verbal run through, you mentioned page 14 in passing. Did you? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, page 14 of the reports pack. So um, it was so page I, eight, uh, eight of the report. So page, page oh, 14 I'll, in the reports pack. Oh, I was looking at yeah, my, my the report I'm looking at only goes up to page 11. So I understand. OK, so, thank you. Yeah, it's, it, page, page eight, if, if you're not using the reports back yet. Michael, did you have anything more you wanted to add on that? Your hand's still up or are you, are you complete? 
Miss Louise. Any further questions or comments? I think we just have to note this one. Is that right, Matthew? Yes, yeah. that's correct. Yeah. All right then. Do you want to go straight on then with that progress report, then, Mark? Yep. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the progress report, um, the recommendations here are to, to note the progress up to the 21st of August this year and the implementation status of the high priority recommendations. Um, so I'll start at paragraph 2.2, which is on page three of the report or 21 of the reports pack. Um, the table here shows the final reports that have been issued um, for 1920. Um, since the last meeting. Um, there's currently one report that's outstanding because uh, um, one report went today, which you, you may have seen drop into your inbox. Um, so there's one report that's that's outstanding. Um, we've got a, a meeting scheduled for that in um, about 10 days, 10 days, two weeks time, um, just to run through the final points on that to, to try and move that one towards um, being finalized. Um, the table at 2.3 highlights the um, final reports that have been issued from 2021 um, in the period between the last committee and this one. Um, so there's there's two reports that have gone. The, um, you would also have noted that the review of FAR was finalised earlier, uh, uh, late last week. Um, so you would have seen a copy of that, um, which isn't included in this report and will be reported um, in the next progress report. Um, paragraph 2.5 talks about high priority recommendations. And this highlights the two high priority recommendations that were made in the development management review. Um, the progress on these can also be found in Appendix B, so an update in terms of, of where they are in, in terms of completion. Um, but I can report, say, if you stop scrolling down to Appendix B, um, they've been reported both on track to be implemented by their target dates, which I believe were the end of August and the end of September. Um, Obviously, the August one came just before the committee deadline, so um, we didn't manage to, to get that as, as implemented. Um, and paragraph 2.8. Um, so just to put this into context, as a result of um, COVID-19 and the impact it had on service delivery, both at an operational level and for us as a service, um, it, we were required to make changes to the um, audit plan because we didn't we, we couldn't resource it. 12 month plan to be delivered in, in a shorter number of days across the partnership. Um, so the head of SIAS had discussions with SIAS board members um, around the reductions that um, would, would need to be made to plans in order to make it um, deliverable over the period of time that we had. Um, so for North Hearts, that resulted in um, a reduction of 28 days from the audit plan. So that went from 320 days down to 292 days. Um, which you'll see in Appendix A, um, the total number of days will be lower um, than, than originally planned. Um, in making these changes, both um, service director for resources and myself tried to safeguard the number of audit, um, audit projects that we were delivering. So um, a lot of the savings came out of, or, or a lot of the reduction in days came out of um, overhead time or, or time that was no longer required. Um, so, in making these changes, we've only had to remove one audit project, um, and that is the um, the project at, at um, point A, the antisocial behaviour audit. Um, and the end of that sentence um, was that um, th this was cancelled as a result in a change in priority for the for the service, um, and um, essentially we we were unable to deliver that audit with the service. Um, at the time that we, we had planned to do it. So um, we made the decision that, that that would be one that we could look to cancel this year and will be part of our planning for next year to consider whether we should be delivering that next year. Um, when hopefully, fingers crossed, we get a full 12 month um, year to, to deliver audit work. Um, so apologies that that sentence was missed off. That was, that was picked up after the... Um, papers were submitted, so please accept my apologies. Um, the other projects that you'll see now that have been um, removed from the plan, so shared learning and joint, remu uh, joint reviews, 
um, that totaled five days in the plan and we've removed that because as a service um, we won't be delivering any joint reviews this year given the um, reduced amount of time we have and um, the shared learning offer was essentially um, seen as that value adding part rather than kind of our core our core business of delivering assurance to um, officers and members at our authorities so um, as I say, we try to safeguard that delivery of assurance in order to be able to provide a robust opinion at the end of the year. Um, we've removed contingency, um, so we don't have any contingency in the plan this year, um, which saved us 12 days. Um, should anything um, urgent or um, priority come up within the next or six months or so, then um, the service director of resources and myself would have a conversation around whether we can replace a, a project that is currently planned with um, anything else that takes priority over that. So the loss of contingency doesn't mean we lose our flexibility. Um, it just means that we may have to reprioritize what projects we can deliver this year um, and may result in, in further changes. Um, and finally, um, we've removed one day from um, progress monitoring. Um, effectively to, to reflect that during the first three months of the year, there was not a lot of progress to uh, monitor. So um, we, we've reduced that budget down. Um, I'll move down to um, paragraph 2.11, um, where it gives you the updated um, performance to date this year. So I'll just give you the updated figures there. So in terms of plan days, um, performance indicator one, uh, we've now delivered 78.5 days, which takes us up to 27%. Um, and we remain at three projects to draft report. So overall, my summary would be that we're, we're roughly on track with where we need to be. Um, but I think the next two months are going to be quite critical to ensure that we continue to stay on track. Um, so... Um, I'll, I'll talk you through Appendix C when we get there and, and what I mean by that, but um, my expectation is before the end of this month, we should complete three projects to draft reports. So there'll be another three to draft. Um, and then another three should hopefully be completed in early to mid-October. Um, so that will take us up to almost half the plan delivered um, by, by mid-October, which will be a good position to be in um, considering um, that we've got key financial work which which we um, prioritise the delivery of so that will be those audits will get completed um, and then quarter four um, we haven't got um, any large audits planned which gives us a bit more flexibility around um, timings to, to do them so at, at this point I'm, I'm confident but the next two months um, are quite critical to that um, the other thing I'd add is that all audit projects have now been allocated to auditors, um, either through our internal team or with our partners BDO. So um, we're not concerned about resourcing any of the work. That, that's already been planned. Um, it's just um, really getting used to the, the, the new normal and the, the remote way of, of delivering our work that we have been over the past sort of three or four months, really. Um, so if we can scroll to um, Appendix C, which is on page 12 of the report or 30 of the reports pack. Um, so in here, this um, this is where I mean the next couple of months are going to be quite critical because all work that started, I would expect to be completed in the next couple of months. So um, provided um, we can kind of maintain the momentum that we've got and the progress that we're making, um, I've got no reason to believe that they won't be completed. Um, Obviously, things may happen and they might not be, but that, that's kind of the point I'm, I'm making, that we're, um, we're, we're on track, in my view, but we need to complete the work that's already started. Um, that's it from me, unless anybody has any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, can we see hands raised if there's any questions or comments? I've lost it. What's the hand? <laughs> Would you like to ask a question or make a comment, Michael? Yes. Hang on, I've lost it somewhere. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Mark, I, I just wonder, with, with COVID, 
the difficulties you must be having in getting information. I mean, the documents, the papers and the accounts and that sort of thing. Um, are you still attending at uh, the North Hearts offices at all or is it all remote? It must make life very difficult for you. Um, so, uh, no, we're not doing um, physical um, meetings at the moment. Everything's done remotely. Um, it does present challenges, but I think all service areas have experienced challenges through um, working in different ways. Um, I think we, as a team, we have been working remotely in terms of not everybody's in the office um, for quite a long time. Um, we've developed quite good relationships with all our clients. Um, so actually the engagement is, is quite easy to get from, from officers. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge we faced is that, that everybody's adjusting to, to working in different ways. Um, and in, in doing that, priorities get shifted and I, I'm not naive enough to think that all it's at the top of anybody's priority list. So, mm. um, it, it, you know, that, that's the biggest challenge, but in terms of getting information, um, and kind of reviewing evidence and things like that, um, we, we've got good technical solutions to that. Um, you know, either using zoom or teams, we can screen share and physically view what, what the, um, what the officers are viewing. Um, we've got secure, um, file transfer um, systems that we can use to to get um, any electronic files transferred across so operationally um, we've got everything we need to be able to deliver our work um, it's just the um, adjustment of, of of a new way of working and a, and a different way of doing things that, that has been challenging well, thank you mark well clearly it's working because you're virtually on track with your plan anyway aren't you so uh, so well done thank you Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments, Mark? No. Um, I'd just like to say, I think bearing in mind kind of everything that uh, COVID-19 has, has presented to you, that this is this is a cracking job. Um, it's good to see what uh, what little has had to be um, pushed back or taken out of the plan and pleased to see that you're able to still provide that assurance with with what you've got left and uh, I have in my briefing from from Ian that there is plenty of coverage to enable an assurance opinion so I was going to say that in some but that would be wrong of me not to attribute that to Ian uh, but well done and thank you um, I think this is the end of your sessions so if you wanted to leave that would be fine thank you very much chair thank you everyone thank you. thanks okay wonderful um uh, moving on then, we now got a slight change in the agenda because I understand that we need to uh, go through the annual gov governance before we can do the rest of the agenda. So we are now going to the annual government statement of 19 and 20. Um, if I could ask Ruben to present that for us, please. Thank you, Chair. As you say, this item is to for the committee to approve the final version of the annual government statement for 1920 and the corresponding action plan. Um, the report provides detail of the amendments of, to the statement and the action plan since I brought this to you in July. And if you go down to 5.1, it outlines um, what I asked in July to provide feedback. And I've got feedback from Ernst & Young around um, updating respect to the impact of COVID-19 and then the corresponding actions of the council. I circulated that amended version to uh, external partners and committee members at the end of July for comment and I've outlined all of those amendments in that section 5.1 so you don't have to scroll through the, the statement itself um, and that's I think all I really want to say because you'll have seen the, the, the guts of this beforehand and it is those amendments around COVID-19 that are new and you'll have seen so I'm happy to take comments or questions from you and, and obviously appendix A is the statement itself in its revised form. Brilliant, thank you Ruben and thank you again for bringing it to us at the last meeting so that we could have foresight of this. Um, are there any hands raised, any questions or comments? It's such a meaty agenda, we're gonna get through it quite quickly. Uh, nothing at all? 
Okay, so we are being asked if we uh, approve the amended uh, annual governance statement and action plan that sits in Appendix A. Did you want to speak on Appendix A at all, Ruben? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think, as I say, I think you'll have seen this in its in uh, July and then the additions I've, I've outlined at 5.1 of those COVID-19 things. And I've tried to fit them against those principles so they are meaningful, um, which I've outlined there. And I will say, actually, the action plan has got references to um, actions that will take forward um, the recovery board, project board, and the, the, the delivery of that recovery plan, um, which will get fed back in various ways throughout the year. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Ruben, and with no hands raised. Uh, uh, Matt, do we need to vote on the approval of this or do we just accept it? No, yeah, I, th I think a vote would be necessary for this. Okay, so if everybody remembers how to vote, if, you're, if you are in favour of approving the amended AGS and action plan, uh, could you vote yes? If not, could you vote no? And if you wish to abstain, could you raise your hand? That's carried, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Bear with me. Okay, so uh, if we could now move to item eight, uh, the draft audits result, audit results report, um, which we have, uh, I think we have Nazir and Suresh. Uh, Good evening, Chair. Uh, good evening, members of the committee. Um, our audit results report was part of the um, supplement pack that you hopefully have received uh, and starts at page 109 of that pack. Um, I'll give you a pretty kind of top level uh, summary of where we are and then both Nazir and I will talk you through some of the key items in the executive summary. Um, it, in essence, uh, we have got three procedures that we need to complete in order to be able to conclude on the audit and all three as you may expect are kind of related somewhat to the uh, impact implications of COVID-19 on the financial accounts as well as the associated audit. Um, the first one of those is around the work we have been doing on property valuations where we've had to engage our own experts EY real estates to consider the material uncertainty that your own valuer has reported um, on the property valuations. Second one relates to pension disclosures where uh, as part of our work we seek assurances from the auditor of Hertfordshire County Council Pension Fund and uh, as that is me as well I can tell you that the audit of all pension funds this year have been complicated by um, the impact of Covid on the valuations of investments at the year end particularly what we what we call um, hard to value investments, things like private equities, etc. So that work is still ongoing at the pension fund. And then um, the third area uh, or procedures that we need to complete is around the audit report, where um, included in the report you'll you'll see reference to internal consultation within EY to make sure that we are appropriately worded in your audit report, particularly around um, going concern and those property valuations that I talked about. Um, all three of those procedures I anticipate will we will be concluding by the end of September. So it would have been nice to be able to come to the committee to say we have finished everything. But uh, unfortunately, like I say, we've got those three areas that are outstanding. Um, notwithstanding those three outstanding procedures, I think it's worthwhile saying that the actual audit has gone really smoothly. And touching on um, questions that I think Councillor Weeks asked the internal audit, we have received uh, really good cooperation from the finance team to carry out our audit 100% um, remotely. Um, that has been done with, I would say, not a significant amount of challenge, but there has been some challenge. But um, both the finance teams and the audit teams have worked uh, incredibly strongly together to get to a position where those 
three areas that I talked about are the only three things that we need to complete to uh, conclude the audit. Um, and once those three procedures are complete, I'm anticipating issuing an unqualified audit opinion on your accounts and having no matters to report on your value for money conclusion, which is um, another positive position to be in as a local authority. So if I just take you to the executive summary, which starts on uh, the pack of page 1113 uh, or page five of the actual document itself, you'll see reference there to the, the impact of COVID-19 on the audit as we referred to um, back in June when we, when we gave you an update to the audit plan. And you'll see reference again to those, those, those issues that I talked about in terms of concluding the work that we need to do on property valuations and then around the uh, going concern disclosures. Um, over on page 114, we just kind of highlight again uh, further kind of impact of COVID. Uh, and then on page 115, we there tell you what we, where we are with the audit. And I'll let Nazir just, just update you on a few of those other areas on that page. Nazir? Thanks, Rish. Um I'll be just giving an overview of like uh, what's our status as of today. So in terms of our audit procedures, there are certain procedures which we need to complete. Uh, the first one relates to procedures on our property evaluations. So as Suresh mentioned, uh, it's for certain procedures, we are engaging our real estate specialists on that, especially on the assets where the valuation is based on the market data because of the COVID uh, uncertainties. The second one is around the pensions uh, <coughs> pension funds. We are waiting for the report from the pension fund auditor on that. And the third one is um, our internal procedures on going concern assessment and the disclosure node. So we'll be doing our review on the going concern assessment, which we have done our initial review, uh, but the final internal procedures are still in progress on that. The other one is with regard to the final review of the statement of accounts. So we have received the statements, but once we conclude on the property evaluation work and once we conclude on the pension funds, we just need to do a final review on the statements. Um, our final review uh, procedures are in progress. So again, it depends on the three main items, which once we conclude that, we'll be able to close our internal review procedures on that. Um, with regards to subsequent events review, so once we manage to uh, substantially complete the remaining procedures, we'll just do a quick subsequent events procedure just to make sure there are nothing significant which uh, we need to perform any procedures on that or need any additional accounting adjustments with regards to that. And the final one is uh, we just need to get the final management representation letter once we conclude our audit procedures on that. I just wanted to kind of quickly highlight the going concern uh, focus because you, you'll recall from the June update I gave you that that was a, a new area of focus in light of the impact of COVID. And you'll see referenced on page 116 uh, and then later on a bit more detail in the report, we've referenced that the, the work of, um, of, of the service director resources in terms of the uh, assessment that had been made in terms of uh, articulating the financial impact of, pan of the pandemic on the authority. And you'll see in the, in, the, in the final version of the accounts that are in the pack also, that there is a new disclosure note around going concern, which we've, um, we've worked collaboratively with um, the service director to ensure that um, that is reporting uh, transparently the, the position of the authority in terms of the impact of the pandemic on your financial position as it relates to going concern. And you'll also see reference to the fact that we will include a emphasis of matter paragraph in our audit report around that disclosure. And just to be clear, that, that emphasis of matter is, is not a qualification or a modification of the report, but it, it as it says, is highlighting to the reader of the account something which we think is important uh, and that they, they should be aware of. Uh, two final things I just wanted to highlight before we open up to questions. Uh, first one is on value for money. So uh, page 130 and 131 of the PAC or 22, 23 of the report, we outlined there that we, if you remember in that plan, we had one significant risk around the new, well, there was a new property acquisition and development strategy. Uh, and we outlined there the work that we did to address that risk, looking at the arrangements the authority had to, to in effect, manage the risks associated with that strategy. And you'll see on page 131 where we've outlined the detail of what we identified 
and we identified some good arrangements in place to actually mitigate the risks around that new strategy. Well, clearly, we're aware that COVID-19 has, has somewhat um, has somewhat now paused that strategy, but the arrangements that you you had put in place, uh, we felt were appropriate for the for the uh, for the strategy being being adopted. And then finally, uh, I'll just take you to page 141 of the pack uh, or 33 of the document, which is the fee analysis. Just to one, um, highlight to you that we, we flagged in the audit plan where there'd be areas of additional work as a result of risk, which is like mainly around the value for money conclusion. And we've, um, we've already shared with uh, the service director resources the breakdown of the additional fee associated to VFM risk, which was the £4,000. Um, obviously, the additional work around things like going concern and asset valuations and the consultations we are we need to conclude on before we then, uh, again, provide some detail to the service director about additional fees that are associated to those additional items of work. Um, other than that, Chair, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, very detailed coverage, uh, which I'm sure we all appreciate. Um, I haven't got any hands raised yet, but I'm sure there will be some questions. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Um, Ian would, Cooper, would I be able to bring you in just to discuss some of the things, uh, uh, some of the points that you noted uh, to me in your summary around uh, the request for delegation for the next item and what it means for this item. Um, it allows us to note this item um, and to sort of reflect on it. Um, all it means is all it's just because that the audit has not been completed in the usual year. We would hope the audit would be completed in time for this meeting and then we could, well, essentially physically sign the accounts at the meeting. Obviously, we can't physically sign the accounts anyway, but the audit work means that we be not being completed means we have to wait to do that and that's why we're looking for delegation the next item but still to note all the work that Ernst and I've done and to sort of reflect on the fact that apart from a few well quite significant but actually in the grand scheme minor areas and hopefully people will find at the end of it um, it's all been done and hopefully I think the message I'm getting from them is that all, all, all the accounts are accurate. Indeed thank you. Um, are there any questions and or comments then for Sir Resh or Nazir? Anything at all? I feel like an auctioner. No, nothing. All right, then the um, the uh, recommendation is that we note that. Um, hang on one second, let me just check that recommendation. Uh, that's it. I think we just need to note this and note all the good work that Ernst and Young have done um, under exceptional circumstances. We want to say thank you for that. Um, and yeah, we'll move on to the next item. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, right, Ian, do you want to take us through then the statement of accounts? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so most of the detail really is covered by the work that Ernst and Young have done. Um, they are there to give you assurance and give the read to the accounts um, assurance that the content therein is uh, uh, materially accurate. Um, so looking for the, the assurance and that, that last report in relation to that. Um, I would like to, in presenting the report, just reconfirm, it's confirmed in the, in, the, in the report and in the same accounts that I am satisfied that the state of accounts present a true and fair view of the financial position of the authority at the end of the financial year and that the authority's income and expenditure for that financial year is also um, shown as a true and fair view. I state that because I'm required to by statute um, prior to approval of the accounts, so I'm just re it again. Um, as I said, the, the key bit really is recommendation 2.3, uh, sorry, 2.2. And the fact that we want, I'm looking to delegate, uh, you to delegate authority to the chair of the committee uh, to approve the accounts uh, when uh, Ernst and Young completed their work. Um, I am hopeful um, that there will be no changes at all to the accounts um, between then, between now and when that happens. Uh, it's possible there will be a few little minor changes, um, potentially rising from the audit report. Um, and so we work on the uh, pensions. Um, so it's possible a few minor changes, um, but hopefully 
the committee happy that subject to uh, myself, uh, the chair of the committee, and as you know, agree that they are they are minor changes that you'll have to delegate uh, that 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 applies to to approve the accounts to to the chair of the committee. Um, obviously, if there are more major changes, we'll, we'll bring the bring the whole report back to the committee. Um, the reason for wanting to do it as a delegation is that there uh, in the um, legislation there is a requirement to approve the accounts by the end of November. Uh, that's an extended deadline from previous years uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the next scheduled meeting of this this, this meeting uh, is uh, just uh, early September, so we won't have missed the, the, the deadline for approving the accounts. Uh, so subject to being no material uh, changes, please approve that delegation, uh, and then we'll, we'll do we'll do we'll do the uh, sign off the accounts uh, when we get approval from Merchant Young. Uh, apart from that, I wasn't going to cover anything else, um, but have to take any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, so any questions or comments on the statement of accounts? We'll talk about delegated authority in a moment, um, but any questions or comments on the statement itself? Wow. Quite a lot tonight. Okay. Um, anything, any questions or comments on the delegated authority for approval of those statement of accounts once Ernst and Young have completed their work? Nothing at all. Okay, brilliant. Um, okay, so the recommendations in front of us are then that we uh, approve the, the draft statement of accounts based on the draft audit um results report and that we uh delegate to the to myself and ian and i'm just trying to see who else it would be ian is it just me and you it, it, the formal delegation is to you i will provide advice on that there being no material change no significant changes but your it was your delegation to you to actually do the actual signing of the accounts Okay, so let's have two votes then. So let's let's vote whether or not we approve the draft statement of accounts um, uh, based on the draft audit results report. So if we can have a yes, you vote yes, no if you do vote no, and raise your hand if you abstain. Sure, can I just um, have a point of clarification? Yes. Um, it, with the, this is a sort of a joint administration question more, so it's really sort of only relevant for those in the red and orangey yellow corners of, of, of those here. Um, would it be for you solely or would that be something that the deputy um, and that portfolio should also be involved with approval? I don't, I don't, I mean, it's a, I don't know the answer to that question. It's just, a, uh, we, we haven't had yeah. this before, have we? It's not, um, it's not a portfolio question, it's a committee question and I believe it's just the chair, is that right, Ian? Yep, it's the chair of the committee approving the accounts required to sign them off, so it is not an executive function. Okay, so if we move to that vote. Yes, that's carried, Chair. Thank you. And then if we could just move to the vote on the delegation um, uh, to myself for the final approval of the annual statement of accounts. Um, yeah, if we can move to the vote on that, please. That's carried, Chair. Lovely. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, okay, so then we move to the risk management update, which is yourself again, Ian. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Just logging in back into the tablet again. Sorry. Um, so this, the most of the detail of this one uh, is. in paragraphs uh, 8.2 through to 8.5, uh, which goes through the main changes to uh, the corporate risk that are proposed uh, to Cabinet and for you to review before it gets to Cabinet. Uh, so in paragraph 8.2, it talks about the uh, risk in relation to antisocial behaviour. Um, 
there had been a lot of work prior to um, the lockdown uh, in the case of COVID-19 in relation to um, antisocial behaviour and the impact on our properties. Uh, with the, sort of ex the more extreme lockdown in the early period, uh, there was a corresponding reduction in antisocial behaviour at the same time. Uh, people weren't leaving the houses, so that does affect uh, that, that, that behaviour. Um, and there hasn't really been any pickup, significant pickup since. Um, so it is looking promising that a lot of the actions we've put in place are starting to have an effect, uh, but don't want to count chickens just yet. Um, so that's the reason the proposal is to remove the juicer score from a seven to a five. Uh, uh, but uh, in line with the new way we look at risks, we set a target score. And the target score I proposed for it is a score of three. Um, and subject to uh, reaching that score, we'll bring it back again for a further review and potentially look at archiving that risk on the basis we've put in place and in values of business as usual, all the actions to, uh, to mitigate that risk uh, happening in future. Uh, moving on to paragraph 8.3, and this is, a, this is, this is the uh, COVID-19 uh, risk, um, and obviously this is a constantly evolving one. Uh, so this is the review as at the last risk management group. Um, we obviously look at this risk on a regular basis, uh, but as at that point, um, and you know, still for North Hearts, uh, in particular, uh, incidents of, of, of COVID-19 infections are, are low uh, and have remained low, um, and therefore proposes that uh, score is reduced from a nine to an eight. Um, there are still implications in terms of um, how we recover a few service areas uh, fully, although in the May, most service areas are now back running to as normal as they can be in the current situation. Uh, the main sort of area where there's place to work to do um, is leisure, uh, but that's a sort of gradual process uh, based, based on people's appetite to, to use those facilities, but also around the sustainability of the SLO as a contractor, and then focusing on recovering the, um, the service areas that you know, are, are better financially for them first, and then moving on to the other areas later on. Um, and I suppose in relation to that, picking up on 8.4, um, the risk management group did discuss the leisure management contract in general as a risk. Um, but then following that meeting, there was further work to look at separating into two risks, one being the general risk uh, in relation to SLL in a normal year, and the second one being the risks in relation to COVID-19 and the impacts on SLL and the leisure contract. Um, that's what presented to you at this meeting is a proposal that specific risk in relation to COVID-19 and the impact on SLL is considered to be a corporate risk and has a risk score of eight, which in lines with the sort of the general COVID-19 risk. Uh, and that's to reflect the fact that whilst there are, there's a big overall risk, there really is a significant risk in relation to that, to, to that service provision uh, in that it is an area that, that, that is very susceptible to, to demand and, and has a high cost base, and therefore that's why it's in there. And then finally, in paragraph uh, 8.5, um, a few meetings back, there's a proposal to uh, archive the risk in relation to the optimization of flexion rounds for the waste contract. Um, the service manager for waste and recycling um, has confirmed that all the work is completed. And as you'll see in that paragraph, describes some of the additional work that's going to be taking place um, very soon. Um, I made a sort of talk about a further review. And I think the conclusion was that the chair of this committee is going to talk to the chair of OVN scrutiny about that potentially being a OVN scrutiny function um, as it relates to the actual service and policy rather than the risk side of it. Uh, so what I'm looking for here, subject to agreement, is that um, we say that the conclusion, the, the risk can be part on the basis that there is no longer any significant risk in relation to that, uh, but that there is probably some open question around the, the scrutiny of, of waste uh, of those collection rounds, uh, but that's a separate thing to, to the risk. Um, so there the, 
the, the four main paragraphs and they link into the uh, recommendation 2.1 and 2.2. Uh, I don't have to take any questions. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, we'll go straight to Sam Collins. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll jump, I'll go in sort of backwards order here. Um, the first point was the one we just heard about relating to the collection rounds and the outstanding issue of overview and scrutiny. That is still outstanding um, and there is something that needs to be done there. But I think um, I think you're on the case there and discussing it with the chair of ONS. So I'll, I'll leave that one there, but I, I will raise it again if we don't hear more about it. But I'd like to see that work completed before we do anything more with that risk, perhaps. Um, Regarding the risks to Stephen's leisure, I'm going to pick my words slightly carefully here because I don't really think it's worth us all diving. We've got quite an agenda and I don't want to dive into part two. But there's a new story in the Comet today um, that's on their website relating to that company and funding for it coming from SBC. Um, it, I'm just wondering, this is sort of something to consider rather than to maybe get an immediate answer and maybe something for the chair to contemplate going forwards. But is it worth us as this committee getting a slightly more detailed report in part two in a future meeting as to what's really what's going on there? Um, because I think to downgrade the risk when we're seeing headlines like that appearing in the press um, seems quite odd. And I feel personally that, I, that perhaps there's some elements to that that we don't fully understand yet or we haven't fully got the full story on or perhaps fully, haven't fully examined. So maybe it's something to do in this committee in part two, which means it's obviously we can talk freely about some of those financial issues. Um, and as we have discussed slightly in the past in part two as well. Um, but I think it's difficult to say much more than that in part one. And I don't think it's worth going to part two to discuss it at this point, because that story's only been in the press for a few hours. Um, then going on to the more sort of meaty thing, which I saw that jumped out at me, just looking at the, the risk sort of matrix was, um, I was very surprised to see that the coronavirus risk was downgraded, but that with sort of the explanation we had from the service director there, it made a little bit more sense in that that decision was taken quite a little bit of a while ago. And since that time, things have moved on quite significantly. But I would personally, having looked at the sort of the data we're getting um, and the wider national and international situation that we really shouldn't be downgrading that risk because all the data is pointing in the in the unfortunately the wrong direction and it looks like that risk is going to be quite significant again in North Hertfordshire and nationally and internationally um so I'd personally like to see that put back up to a nine because it's I don't think the reasons for downgrading are valid now when they were valid previously um so I think I'll leave that there but I think others have similar comments Thank you, uh, Sam. I, I, um, I just want to talk briefly on the uh, route optimization. I am in agreement with the service director on this. I think that uh, there is absolutely work to do and that work sits with overview and scrutiny. It's no longer posing a risk, it is a resolved risk. And so archiving it is entirely appropriate. Um, and you're absolutely right. It does need to be very uh, carefully looked at in the scrutiny role. Um, and it is uh, in danger of being missed in either camp if we keep it in both. So I'm very keen to move this into an overview and scrutiny function. So I'm in favour of that. Um, Ian, did you want to talk on uh, the, the movement there of the coronavirus risk? Um, and uh, yeah, and Councillor Collins' points there. Ian Cooper, sorry. Uh, yes, happy to. Um, so I think just to pick up on those two points, uh, Council Collins mentioned the downgraded score for the uh, leisure COVID-19 risk. It's a, new, it's a new risk. It's not a downgraded score for that one. Uh, that is just a proposed eight. Um, and you also talked about a part two report um, for Council to receive a report at the end of this month in relation to uh, the support to SLL. I think that's where the perfect opportunity to discuss in more detail there around the ins and outs um, and then you get the uh, 
uh, relevant service director there as well, as well as uh, um, sort of a bit of financial scrutiny too. So that's probably a good place to do that. Um, and yeah, I, I take your point on terms of the overall COVID-19 risk. Uh, nine, eight, it could be either. It, 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 it's moving around all the time. Uh, I wouldn't be averse to recommending that it stays as a nine. I kind of see arguments both ways. Okay, um, let's go to Sam North and then we'll take a, an opinion on the eight and nine for coronavirus. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I was only going to speak in support of what Councillor Collins said. I think um, changing coronavirus now is a little bit image, uh, sort of a bit too early. Um, and I think we need to consider um, the potential for second waves, particularly as we're seeing um, the increase in, in um, numbers of cases on a national basis, national level, and, and also central beds have seen recently increases. And I think that it, we're, we're, we're not out of that yet and so reducing the likelihood from medium to uh, from high to medium would be um, uh, fairly dangerous from from our perspective and I also would like to um, reconsideration to be put towards the impact of antisocial behaviour on the council as well. Um, I think although I can understand that recently there has been a um, reduction in the antisocial behaviour, firstly um, we are seeing a huge rise in uh, job losses. Uh, kids are going back to school, so therefore they're going to be out more of the day uh, with their friends and they're able now to socialise more than where they were during lockdown. And secondly, having visited the council offices today um, at about five o'clock in the afternoon and heard some quite loud kids in the uh, Letchworth car park, um, I don't think that we can reduce that as of yet. Um, and I think that we should keep it where it is in order that we are still um, reviewing it. And I don't think the likelihood has, has decreased and would actually suspect that um, as we are considering these risks over a long term, um, likelihood could perhaps have actually increased since the last review. Um, so I think for the time being, um, I'd like to keep both uh, the impact on social behaviour and the coronavirus. Uh, risks as they were before um because i personally don't see that the rationale for changing them is strong enough to um, make that change at the moment thank you sam are there any is, did, would anybody else like to comment on that on the antisocial behavior particularly um coronavirus sam collins you want to come back on that again uh, yeah, just on the antisocial behaviour. I didn't really talk about that. But yes, I, I agree with Councillor North, um, not for the first or probably last time. Um, but it, 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 antisocial behaviour is a big issue um, across the district. Um, those of us in Hitchin know all about that at the moment. And there are, I, I can see with the previous comments about coronavirus, I think we are, if we do, there's going to be a lot of people that are hanging around, particularly young people, without much to do, and that increases the risk of uh, antisocial behaviour. So I do think that the, those a lot of these things we're talking about are interconnected, and I do think that, that, that that's why I'm in favour of not, not downgrading these things. Thank you. Um, I'll come to you, Adam and Michael, in a moment. Ian, I just want to give you an opportunity to, to respond to that. I am I'm quite reticent to, to uh, ignore, I guess, the advice of the risk management group, and I'd like to understand what evidence um, they they examine in order to make those recommendations. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so just to be clear, this risk is around the impact of antisocial behaviour on council facilities. It's not a general antisocial behaviour risk. Um, and the main uh, area identified in relation to that and the biggest impact on us was the Lairidge car park. Uh, there have been a lot of work by the community safety team in that car park and uh, physical improvements put in place in relation to it, um, including changes to the doors and the way they work, so they couldn't access from the bottoms of the stairwells, and uh, moving the parking team back into the car park. They've been moved across to the town hall, uh, but they've been moved back across to the car park, uh, which provides a kind of physical presence to deter some of the behaviour that was going on in there. Um, and also, I think it had uh, really been increased on the police's radar 
uh, certainly the PCSO uh, for the area was really engaged in some meetings we had in relation to, to the car park and ensuring that, that actions were taken to uh, address two of the sort of main issues, which was um, firstly homelessness uh, and people uh, sort of sleeping in the stairwells uh, and, and the implications of that. And the second one being um, basically school children uh, hanging around the car park um, and in some instances um, causing such a nuisance it was putting off people using the car park um, but that engagement both by the community safety team and also by the police with the local schools had this is going back pre-lockdown had had an impact on that and the schools were taking it seriously and that's why kind of the proposal was that because of all those actions taking place, the score be be reduced. Uh, it's still still proposed it'll be a corporate risk. Uh, I'm not at this stage saying that uh, it's not a corporate risk, and therefore the the actions in relation to it will stay the same. We'll still keep monitoring on a regular basis. It's just around reflecting the, the current level of of that risk. Thank you, Ian. Um, if I could just move to you, Adam, please. Thank you, Chair. It's just to say that I agree with Councillor Collins and Councillor North about keeping coronavirus as a nine on the matrix. And I think that if you look at page 75, the reasons are quite well explained in the report, which claims, well, says that the risk of the second wave is very likely and that it would have a greater impact than the first. So, yeah, I'd be in favour of keeping it as nine. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Michael Weeks. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I was going to agree with Councillor North and others that perhaps it is a little bit too early to knock down the risk for uh, COVID-19. But having heard what Ian has said, uh, we're talking here about um, what steps the Council has taken to reduce the risk. So uh, I've changed my mind now. I think it's the right thing to do to perhaps knock it down a bit. Hey, thank you. Um, and Sam, Councillor Sam North, did you want to come back? Yeah, I only say thank you to Ian for his um, explanation. I, I, I do still hold by what I say with the antisocial behaviour. I think it's still linked to... Um, all of the repercussions of coronavirus, people losing their jobs, schools going back with kids who won't be able to do a lot outside of school. And I think there are a lot of external factors that are likely to increase the level of antisocial behaviour. And while we've taken incredibly good mitigation measures to prevent that antisocial behaviour from happening, I think we need to wait a little while, um, at least until the next finance audit and risk meeting before we confirm um, that we're happy for that risk to be reduced. I don't think that um, it, it's right right now to uh, make that decision of, of decreasing the, the, the likelihood of, of that happening. Thank you. Um, Adam. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, just listening to Councillor Weeks, and I had an idea, and so there might be a bit of clarification I'm asking for. If the risk is in response to the council's preparedness for a second week away, for example, would that not affect the impact score? So the bottom one, low, medium, high, rather than the likelihood, because it's likely, as the report predicts, that there will be an impact. But it's just what the impact would be, depending on how prepared we are, if that makes sense. So that we're the report says we're expecting an impact and it's quite high but the impact might be less on the council due to our preparedness is that what council weeks was trying to say and the point raised earlier Ian can you come back on that uh, yeah I mean uh, the, the, the risk is around the impact on, on the council and council services and the in the, you know, if there is a second wave, um, some of the work that's been done around responding to, to the first wave will, will be borne in mind and obviously been used to sort of try and minimise the impacts. Um, but having said that, if, if there was another significant lockdown, um, 
that would at the same time impact on our services, nothing to do about it. Um, so it, we might have to recover quicker next time because we know what we're doing a bit more. Um, but but a, a lockdown that you know, essentially stopped a number of activities would affect our services, uh, as would uh, any significant uh, spike in, in um, incidences, or inc incidences of uh, COVID-19 in our staff or our contractors, that would affect how we deliver services. So yes, we've got in place to, to minimise the impact and recover as quickly as we can, but you know, the, the points are correct that we can't mitigate it against all of them, and that's why there's a significant risk there. And would I be right in thinking, it, Ian, that you that no, no level of preparedness will mitigate financial risks because our income will, will cease where it ceased before? That's likely. Uh, if, if there was a lockdown of shops, for example, that would affect our car parts, which is the biggest impact in the first wave. Um, it would also affect, you know, the ability for those centres to show over, which is the, probably the second biggest impact in the first wave. So, uh, yeah, uh, there, there's nothing we can do about that. It's just a case of uh, those centres supporting SLL to, to what they stopped doing and when, and mm -hmm. for car parks just taking the hit. Uh, we do now know that for car parks, there is an income guarantee in place from uh, central government, which I'll talk about in the, um, the later report on uh, the budget monitoring report, um, which will help to mitigate some of that risk, although it still leaves quite a significant impact left with us. Thank you. That, that brings a lot of clarity. Thank you. Um, I've still got Councillor Michael Weeks. Your hand is still up. Is that a legacy hand or do you want to speak? No, thank you very much. Legacy hand, okay. Uh, right, so we are going to move to a vote and we're gonna do them all separately um, because there's quite a few in there. Uh, let me just get to the top of this page. Right, first of all, we are going to vote um, on the anti-social behavior on council facilities. The recommendation is that we reduce that risk score from a seven to a from a seven to a five with a proposed target of three. If you are in favor of that reduction, then can you vote yes? If you are against that reduction and wish to retain it at a seven, then vote no. And if you wish to abstain, can you please raise your hand? Is that clear for everyone? Nod or shake. So in favor of the reduction, vote yes. Against the reduction, vote no and abstain by raising your hand. So that recommendation is lost. Okay, so we will be retaining the antisocial behaviour on council facilities risk. We'll be retaining that at level seven. Thank you. Um, the next one then, oh, who was that? Clarify for your behalf. Uh, this is actually a cabinet decision, uh, so you are making a recommendation to cabinet okay. to change it, but it's still in the gift of cabinet to make the decision on, on how the risks are treated. Uh, so we do it then to do a referral to cabinet to say that you do not agree with what's proposed. Thank you, Ian. Got ahead of myself. Uh, right, okay, so we will, we will present our recommendation. Uh, okay, so the next one, do we agree with the recommendation that we review the new, uh, the novel coronavirus corporate risk to a reduced score of eight? If you are in favour of reducing that risk to a score of eight, please vote yes. If you are against it, please vote no. If you wish to abstain, please raise your hand. That's lost as well, Chair. Okay, so we are going to recommend that that remains at nine. And uh, we're now going to vote on the new corporate risk that that enters the matrix at number eight. <laughs> um, uh, if everybody, if you are in favour of that new corporate risk, the leisure management contract, uh, COVID-19 uh, implications therein, uh, if you are happy with that being a proposed, proposed score of eight, please vote yes. If you are unhappy with that, vote no. If you wish to abstain, please raise your hand. Oh, I pressed the wrong one. That's carried, Chair. Okay, so we're in, we're, we'll be recommending that that enters at a score of eight. 
Um, Okay, and the final one then, if you are happy to recommend to Cabinet that the route optimization of collection rounds risk is archived and moved into an OFU and scrutiny function, please vote yes. If you do not do archiving, vote no. And if you wish to abstain, please raise your hand. We have four abstentions, Chair, and two, four. Um, um, <laughs> so that means, anyone? Um, Ian, what do be carried. Uh, you've still got three people voting. Um, you've got your quorums in terms of a vote. It's just the paper of abstaining rather than uh, voting for or against. Yeah. So it's, it's carried. Carried, yeah. Okay, lovely, thank you. Always good to have a bit of a challenge. Uh, right, brilliant. Uh, let's move through then. Um, thank you for that. The next bit I think is quite meaty, isn't it? It's our first quarter review monitoring. Um, does anybody want to come for break now? It's quarter two. I think we'll probably like to go past nine o'clock. And um, uh, well, I'm going to call one because I really need one. Um, so uh, we're going to have a five minute comfort break, if that's OK. And I'm going to stop drinking tea. Matthew, is that OK? Yeah, sure, fine. That's, that's OK, fine. we'll come back at 20.50.
the other numbers? One, two. All right, Meg, thank you. I just have to call a break. How's Mia's hand? Cool. That's a pretty decent bandage you did. For those of you that are wondering, the avocado injury has been has been bandaged. With a proper bandage all the way up here. Did you use the avocado skin then? <laughs> I don't know if anyone ate the avocado. I think she probably gave it to her brother. Yeah. <laughs> Just remember, councillors, we are live on YouTube. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Well, for those watching on YouTube, there was a moment with avocados before the meeting and there was an avocado related injury. If you are cutting avocado at home, please do it in a safe way. And there's many guides online showing you how to cut an avocado in a safe fashion. Please don't put an additional burden on our NHS at this difficult time. Are we good to restart? Do you want me to do another roll call, Chair? Are you happy just to? Um, yeah, could you? We look a bit like on the ground. Yeah, sure. Um, so myself is fine. Um, Councillor North. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Collins. Hello, still here. Thank you. Councillor Deacon Davies. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rashira Chaka. Present. Thank you. And Councillor Weeks. Present. Thank you. Ian Cooper. Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, and Ian Albert, Councillor Ian Albert's here as well. Yep. So you're good to go, Chair. Thank you very much. Just bear with me. My tablet has once again decided to Let's move out a little bit. Okay, so thank you for the break there and apologies uh, for those of you witnessing our chat during the break. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on now uh, to item number 11, first quarter revenue monitoring. Ian Cooper, if I can go back to you, please. Thank you, Chair. I think it's item 10 on the agenda, uh, revenue monitor item 10. Um, so I'm going to focus on table three, uh, which is on page 81 onwards, uh, and most of the variances on there uh, relate to COVID-19 and the impact of those. Um, I'll remind you all that uh, at the July meeting, you all saw the uh, financial impact of COVID-19 report. Um, 
just to sort of clarify the differences between what was reported there and what's in, in this report here. Uh, the intention of that specific report in July was to provide a sort of realistic bad case impact. And that was to demonstrate that uh, if that was to happen, the council reserves would be sufficient to not require setting an emergency budget. And that was the conclusion that's been, that was reached at the time by cabinet and is being recommended on to, on to full council at the end of this month. Um, this report here takes uh, more of a less severe pro approach and most report variances reflect what has happened to date only, so the impact of the first quarter without making too many sort of severe assumptions about the rest of the year. Um, the reason for that is that difference in, in, in nuance of the approach, but also to stop budgets going up and down. Uh, we don't want to over-report and then budgets go up, down, up, down throughout the year. Um, so what we've done sort of marry those two up is the commentary in the table, in table uh, three, as I mentioned, uh, sort of explains where the differences and so you can kind of see where, where those are. And also to avoid the overall picture looking too good, um, the table um, paragraph in 8.16 and 8.17 uh, the amount of the uh, non-ring-fenced uh, COVID-19 grant that's been applied has been reduced to give the overall impact of COVID-19 to align to that previous report. If we fully applied that grant, it would look far too good um, because we'd take the full grant but not the full impact of what might be to come later in the year. Uh, what I'd also like to talk about is in relation to that same paragraph 8.16, which does mention uh, the income guarantee, and I did allude to this earlier, there has now been some more guidance issued by the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government in relation to that income guarantee. Uh, in some cases, it's good news, but the majority of it is not so good news. Uh, the bit that's good news is that we can pick and choose which income streams we apply it to. So rather than having to apply it to all of our, all of our income and the us having to fund that first 5%, uh, which was coming to the report last time, we can pick which income streams we use and therefore what the 5% applies to, uh, which means that if we've got any income streams that have hardly been affected at all, we just don't include them and therefore aren't paying a 5% contribution in relation to those. Uh, the bad bit is that it has narrowed down what we can count towards that income guarantee and it only relates to sales fees and charges which have been impacted by a reduction in demand um, which means that certain areas of income which either aren't sales fees and charges or where the impact has been not, an in, not a reduction in demand aren't covered uh, so two examples of that are the garden waste service uh, we lost income in relation to that, but it wasn't due to, due to reduce demand. It was through an inability with our uh, waste operative resources at the time to be able to deliver the service. Uh, so that's not covered by the income guarantee. Um, and the second area that's quite significant in relation to waste is the income from recycled materials, which could be quite significant by the end of the year. Again, that's not a reduction in demand. We're actually getting too much materials in some cases. It's due to uh, market conditions and the fact that the price we can get for those materials has plummeted. Um, in terms of latest forecast and overall impact, and this goes beyond the period this report relates to, uh, up to the end of uh, August, and the last time we looked at the numbers, uh, the latest forecast is actually some of the income recovery has been better than we forecast. Uh, particularly in relation to parking, that it seems to be picking up reasonably well thus far. Uh, obviously, still don't know where it's going to go by the end of the year, but that so far looking, looking better than what was forecast. Uh, so overall, at the moment, with the reduced um, amount from the income guarantee offset by maybe some areas not being as bad as we thought they might be, the actual the forecast we made in that COVID-19 report as presented here in the summary is probably still about right based on where we are at the moment, uh, but subject to significant change throughout the year, I am sure. Uh, these are, as you're aware, unprecedented times. You have nothing to base forecasts on. We are making as best a guess as we can about what's going to happen. 
Uh, the other bit of the report I wanted to also pick up on uh, before opening up to questions and comments was uh, paragraphs 8.3 and 8.4 on page 87 of the pack. Uh, and this relates to a recommendation to Cabinet uh, for a debt in relation to Hitch Your Markets Limited and to request to write the debt off. Um, as explained in the report, uh, issues around uh, the collection of the management fee and the subsequent re-agreement of what that will look like in future. And that means that the debt that accrued is being asked to be written off uh, and it's actually explained in the report. Uh, so I'll stop there and open to questions and comments. Lovely, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, straight to Sam Collins. It seems to be a habit now, doesn't it? I seem to keep mm -hmm. going first. Um, We've talked a lot about the parking in the past um, and Ian Cooper mentioned this sort of, it seems just reading the documents that the government have given us a sort of vague guarantee of funding, but the previous vague guarantee of funding didn't stack up to quite cover the costs of what we were promised anyway. And maybe the portfolio holder will want to jump in on this one because I know he's been looking at it in more detail and he's listening astutely to this conversation. Um, the one thing I just want to put on record, and I know we've talked about this before, I just do want it to put it on record, is that this the, the numbers here are absolutely retrospective and they're not looking, they don't take the assumption that there is going to be a second wave of the virus, whereas currently the data we're all seeing suggests that the second wave is already underway and what we, the numbers we're looking at here could get a hell of a lot worse and coronavirus has already given us a kicking. So I would, so from, I guess from this is more to come from the portfolio holder what 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 assurances he has has he had from government um about what their claimed sort of guarantees considering the last one wasn't up to what was promised and also um what he plans to do and what cabinet plans to do going forwards um in case we do get this second wave which it looks like we're already in the beginnings of ian albert could you come in on that Sure, sure, chair. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, it's a, I mean, this a fair, I mean, it's a fair, I mean, it's a fair challenge you make, Sam. Um, the, you know, we've all, I think we've, we've gone, we've gone around and we've bounced around, and you know, Ian Cooper's team have, have struggled manfully with the and womanfully with the, uh, with the different instructions that have been coming from, uh, from government fairly belatedly. Uh, What's in, what's out is sort of hokey cokey finance, um, to, you know, to be to be honest. And and so we've now got you know if information where we believe that a, a reasonably settled position. Um, but of course, as you absolutely rightly say, that that is, and a lot of the government estimates are are predicated on the fact that things are things can only get better. Um, and of course, sadly to say, that may not be the case. Um, so we are, I mean, we're, do, we're looking at, an, I mean, a number of, a number of, of, of things, not, not, least, not least of which is that, I mean, as part of the medium term financial strategy, but obviously they're looking at sort of budgets going forward, we're setting up a, a new sort of budget challenge group that will look at our uh, root and branch and our budgets both as we head towards the budget workshops and budget setting for um, the next financial year and obviously taking that that further forward so doing what we can uh, to, you know, to do that but of course working with our kind of the LGA and district councils and so on in terms of continuing to lobby uh, the government and we'll certainly I think we wanted to be saying loud and clear that we're we obviously local government, you know, is running short and continues to run run short of uh, short of money. Our, si our situation is 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 better than than the many councils, but there are a number of issues bubbling around un underneath for which actually could turn the situation quite quite seriously. So so you know we're we're always on the on the alert. Um, we are not feeling that we need any kind of emergency budget. Uh, at this time, and hopefully we won't need to. But but clearly, but clearly, if um, if obviously the situation and and heaven hope, hopefully that won't be the case that the situation becomes 
serious again and we go into further lockdowns, local or otherwise, then this will again have a serious detriment to our to our finances, for which for which obviously the result will be in going back to government to lobby for more money. Thank you, Ian. Uh, do I have any other questions or comments for either service director or the exec member? Uh, uh, Ian, I don't know whether it's it itself. I mean, you did you did a table the 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 other day for which we should have shared around uh, cabinet for you know which obviously talked about the the the, uh, the guarantee and obviously you did a obviously now including what was in and, and what was out. Is that something we could share with the, the finance committee? Yeah, absolutely fine too. Uh, I'll kind of summarise details just now, but yeah, I have to share that, share that yeah. increased detail. And we'll continue to monitor that uh, through the subsequent uh, quarterly reports as well. Yeah. So now we now we're clear on what what is in and what's out. Uh, we yeah. can factor that into future reports to this committee as well. But I'll share that kind of yeah headline summary as it stands at the moment as well. Yeah. So I hope that's hope that's helpful, Chair. That might sort of give a bit of extra sort of information to the to the committee. That is helpful. Thank you, Ian. Um, any other questions or comments? We've got quite a lot to, there are quite a few recommendations. This will obviously go to cabinet um, and we need to be satisfied that we are, that we are, agree with these recommendations. So uh, just to read those through then, that we note the report, uh, that we approve the change, or we recommend that cabinet approves the changes to the general fund budget as identified in tar table three, in paragraph eight two, which is a 1.468 million increase in net expenditure. Uh, then we note the changes to the general fund budget um, with a total 186k increase in net expenditure incorporated into the draft revenue budget for 21-22 and that we approve the write-off of those invoices for £17,442.64 for Hitchin Markets Limited that Ian Cooper mentioned there which is explained in paragraphs 8.3 and 8.4. Um, I'm not seeing any hands raised to discuss those points specifically. Uh, we will take a vote to, to ensure that you're all happy that we, that we send that to Cabinet with those recommendations on. So if you are happy with that, could you please vote yes? If you are not happy with that, could you vote no? And if you want to abstain, could you just raise your hand, please? That's carried, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, all right, and Ian, we'll move back to you then. Um, on my notes, it says item 12. I think in the agenda, it says item 11. But it's the first quarter investment strategy, capital and treasury review 2021. If you could just present that for us, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Not to touch on this one. Um, the COVID-19 report in July agreed some changes to the capital programme and capital budgets, which is the reason that table two in the report, which is on page uh, 98, is so short. Uh, just a few little things happened since that report was written. Um, and I suppose the main thing to highlight actually in the report overall uh, is in relation to Treasury. So in paragraph 8.9, I'd like to confirm that we are now uh, come back to the normal investment strategy in terms of limits on the current accounts. So the, limits, the amount in the council's current account is now back below £5 million, and we'll look to retain that as below that limit ongoing from this point forward. Um, if there is a second wave and there are, is more money that we need to kind of keep aside, we'll look at uh, putting provision back in place, but hopefully that will be needed. And also, just in relation to paragraph 8.10, just to highlight the, the, the general economic conditions and the impact that is having um, on our investment returns. So the cash we're investing uh, with banks, building societies and other authorities, uh, the rates of return have plummeted to ridiculously low levels. Um, we continue to look for a place, place to put our money that um, complies with uh, retaining security and liquidity first and then yield after that but 
um, because of the, the general market is just poor. And that's why in the revenue writer report, uh, we forecast that shortfall against the budgeted income for investments. Um, so those are the bits I want to highlight from the report, Chair. Thank you, Ian, uh, for that report. Uh, any questions or comments for Ian on that? Nothing at all. Okay, so same as before then, we are sending this off to Cabinet with the recommendations that they note the forecast expenditure, um, which paragraph 8.3 refers that they approve the adjustments to the capital programme um, as a result of the revi revised timetable of schemes, that they note the position of the availability of capital resources, and that they note the position of treasury, treasury management activity as at the end of June 2020. So if everybody is happy to send that to cabinet with those recommendations on, if you could vote yes, if you are not happy with that, could you vote no? And if you want to abstain, could you raise your hand? Yes, Carrie, Chair. Thank you. Okay, right then. So let's move into the medium term financial strategy. Uh, Ian Cooper, George Tatus. Uh, yes, Chair, thank you. Um, so I think it's perf worth highlighting right at the start uh, the importance of a medium term financial strategy, uh, particularly when considering the council plan and detailed budget proposals for future years. Uh, the MTFS uh, sets the context in terms of how much money you've got. Uh, and obviously it's important to plan according to the amount of money you've got. Uh, don't want to have aspirations you can't afford, but equally you don't want to um, not do things because when you've got money for them and um, so it's all kind of to make sure they're all aligned uh, but I think what I'll do now is I'll turn to uh, the appendix A which is starting on page 51 of the report pack uh, and go through some of the key changes and impacts since uh, sort of the last version of the MTFS which would have been last year um, so we start again with COVID-19 and the impacts thereof uh, I'm afraid um, so this is a section starting with paragraph 2.6 on page 54 and uh, the two big impacts there are as presented in paragraph 2.9 uh, looking forward to next year and beyond we have limited idea as to what how how our income source will recover uh, I've picked out um, sort of three of the big ones there and whilst not reflecting those in the numbers um, for next year uh, those are used to report to do some sensitivity analysis. So if those are worse than the budget for this year, um, what does that look like in terms of our stability ongoing? Uh, and how quickly would we need to react to a different um, strategy compared to what's proposed here? Uh, the other bit that is reflected in the numbers is the forecast in relation to the council tax base. The council tax base is the number of council tax properties uh, in the district that are paying uh, council tax. Uh, that's affected by both uh, new builds and also by eligibility for the council tax reduction scheme. Uh, in previous uh, strategies, assumed a 1% growth, net growth per year in that base, uh, but we've already seen this year a significant increase in uh, CTRS eligibility. People are playing that, as you'd expect. Uh, we're also seeing not too bad, but sort of some suppression in the amount of new properties being built. Um, and therefore, not knowing how long I'll carry on for, uh, the current forecast is that we may see no growth in that council tax base across the uh, five-year period of the MTFS. That's probably, hopefully, a bad case, and hopefully better than that, uh, but it just depends how quickly uh, the economy recovers and how quickly uh, people can drop out, back out of claiming CTRS and start paying council tax again. Uh, and as highlighted in paragraph 2.8, uh, the impact of that uh, by the end of five year period would be a reduction in the annual income of 660,000. So it is quite a significant impact, and that's why I'm highlighting it in the report. Uh, the second change um, compared to sort of previous versions is in relation to pay inflation. Um, that has recently been agreed uh, through national pay bargaining at 2.75%. Uh, that's a one-year pay deal. Um, we are carrying that forward in terms of assumptions for future years, but we'll have to wait and see what 
pay bargain leads to in future years. Um, obviously, pay awards are linked to economic conditions, and generally, the worse the economy, um, the lower the pay deals. Um, but the 2.5% does link in with um, central government state ambitions to increase the uh, living wage, um, sorry, the national living wage, um, and that 2.75 would reflect the trajectory of, 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 of those aspirations, although those aspirations may change uh, given, given the economic state we're, we're faced with. But for now, that seems like a, a sensible assumption to make. Uh, what hasn't changed from previous years, but I will highlight anyway because it's such a significant uh, thing, is the continued uncertainty over future funding. Um, we know there will not be a funding review this year. Uh, we know it's been put back till next year. Uh, so the big uncertainty for, for next year's budget is whether negative RSG, and this is the amount of business rate, further business rate money that central government take away from us whether that will apply or not. Uh, currently, we're assuming it won't because that's what applied for this year when it was delayed from the previous year. And there's another delay on top of that. Um, so hopefully it won't, and that will be as in line with the expectations. But again, in terms of the sensitivity analysis in the budget and the MTFS, we do build in later on in the report what would happen if it was applied next year, so for next year, uh, and therefore that £1 million loss of funding for next year. Uh, but the biggest uncertainty is around what happens in that funding review and impacts for the years 22, 23 onwards, um, and whether what our share of any um, money from the central government will be and what the total pot looks like. And the current assumption is that from that point, an equivalent deduction equal to negative RSG will, will apply, and that will be further way being taken away from us by central government. Um, so the summary of all that, uh, as shown in the table in paragraph 2.29, is that could mean need to make savings of 2.65 million over a five year period, which is a big, big number. Um, and that table also shows the timing of those uh, in terms of the modelling, it's deliberately trying to phase it in over that five year period and using reserves to cushion the impact. Um, just because it's all you know, awareness of the fact that any savings of that kind of scale, as they are likely to involve significant service change, uh, will take a long lead in time. Uh, and as set out in paragraph 2.33, um, there are uh, actions required in relation to those forecasts. And uh, Councillor Albert has already alluded to the fact that uh, there will be the start of a budget challenge process uh, kicking off uh, sort of late this month and into October. Uh, and that's, a, that's the commitment uh, in that third bullet point in paragraph 2.43, the starting point for a full budget review, because uh, that will be necessary uh, to, if that level of savings are required, that is what we will need to do. We we'll need to look at every single line of, of budget and determine if there are any efficiencies left. Not many, I don't think. Uh, and therefore, beyond that, uh, are there any more areas for income generation? Uh, and then after that, as a sort of the last resort, but probably a necessary one, what, what services do we look at changing the way they're delivered? Uh, so obviously, I'm happy that the administration are taking that point of the MTFS seriously and, and are starting that process now, uh, albeit you know, the, you know, the recommendation here is it was just to start sometime next year. So it's really good that that's starting early and really getting ahead of that. Um, so that kind of sets out the kind of key headlines from the report. Um, this is a, this media term strategy is referring to cabinet next and then full council at the end of the month. Uh, so it's for you to comment on and therefore if there are any questions or comments, uh, have to take those. Thank you very much. Um, Ian Albert, I know you want to speak on this, but do you mind if we just go to councillors first with questions and comments to see if you can answer any of those or did you- Yeah, of course. Okay, we'll go to Sam Collins then. Didn't expect that one, did you? Um, it's not exactly rosy, is it, looking at this? It's, it's not a, a wonderful, happy piece of reading. Um, so I'm going to start with something that I just was a little bit, just. I think it's probably very easy to clarify. It, 
Ian Cooper mentioned that the overall council tax base figure will not increase from the set. From my understanding of that, that will come from the fact that people basically aren't building new houses. There's not new households being formed and you're not expecting that in the next five years. I just want to clarify that that's what you meant because with the emerging local plan in mind, that's quite diff different to what some officers in other departments of NHDC have said. So just want to get a little bit of clarity on that. So you're on how what you're expecting in terms of the council tax base and if i'm interpreting that collect correctly then just to jump on slightly um in the assumptions section uh, this medium-term financial strategy only reflects the covid impacts we've seen so far and does not reflect the covid impacts to come um, we've talked about that a little bit previously so we are going to be a little bit reliant on central government to give us funding or to sort out that funding again and it already sounds like in a number of other, a number of other areas and this is probably one for the portfolio holder um that they're again being incredibly vague and uncertain about what what funding they're going to be giving us but we seem to be facing a period of central government enforced austerity and cuts at local authority level but we don't know how much we need to cut what we need to cut and where we need to cut and that's just you know just again what 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 are we expected to do about it and what what is cabinet going to do about it and what, what you know what is the the um, the portfolio holder plan to do with it and then of course we've got this um sort of double whammy if you like horrible expression um of a second covid wave plus a no deal brexit and i know brexit hasn't been taken into account in um in the assumptions made here but it will have a clear knock on effect uh, you know we've got an assumed 99% collection rate for council tax base and 97 percent collection rate for the business rates we're facing massive deep unemployment and an economic crisis of the like this country hasn't ever faced previously at least not since the south sea bubble um we really do need to start thinking i think about contingency planning here and while i can see everything in the empty uh, in the medium-term financial uh, strategies is there for good reason what are we doing to contingency plan going forwards in terms of well, if it all goes badly wrong, which it appears that it is. So there's a lot on your plate. Nice. Thank you very much, Sam. Collins, are there any other hands to raise uh, now before I go to Ian Albert to answer some of those? Um, Ian, is it helpful if I summarise some of those points or did you write them down as well? Yeah, good. Go, give, I've got most of them written down, but if you want to summarise, okay. that's helpful. So I think if we can get um, clarity on the assumption uh, that Sam made there around the council tax base figure not increasing, is that because we're not expecting new housing, which seems to be at odds with some of the other things that we understand for the local plan, or are there other reasons for that we anticipate that or are assuming that base figure won't increase? Um, uh, the assumptions are based on COVID so far and not COVID to come. So are we therefore over-reliant on central government response to what may come? Um, uh, I was writing down and then Sam said it, uh, very high collection rate assumptions. Uh, what's the confidence level of those? Um, have we taken into account Brexit knock-on effects? And with all of the above, what is the contingency? Um, in Albert, if you could answer some of those, then maybe Ian Cooper would like to come in on that. Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> Um, so, so I mean, obviously, one. I mean, one of the one of the, the the problems around around the where we are on COVID at the moment is is around you know the, the council tax reduction scheme because I mean, effectively, as it as it says in in, in paragraph you know two two point seven that because we have got a, a, a larger a larger base of people claiming council tax reduction scheme, effectively, it means just just to st st we've got a smaller number of people to actually try and collect the same amount of money from. So that already leaves us with a, a potentially an additional an additional shortfall, as it as it mentions in in, in two point seven. Now that may change. We ho hopefully um, you know we'll see people back in work, back in full time work, and and so on, and then able to pay their their council tax. But clearly at the moment. That isn't the case, and we may well be faced with a further sort of gap in 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 funding there. Um, in terms of collection rates, I mean, actually, the 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 
collection collection rates and um, you'll uh, those of you who are on overview and scrutiny will will actually have a look at the the indicators um, there on on collection rates which are on which are up for discussion tomorrow evening. I mean, actually, on council tax at the moment, it, actually the collection rates are are good. There's clearly some issues around around business rates, but but on actually on council tax that that still is holding up very well on on the numbers we've seen we've seen so so far um and how Compton was going to give us a further i think update on on those uh, numbers but it is still you know holding up you know very well from what he, he verbally sort of said to me i mean formally speaking no, i mean no sam there isn't anything specifically i don't think and Ian will correct me if i'm wrong built in in, in here in terms of uh, of brexit um I mean, if you if you know what we should build in in Brexit, <laughs> I'd be I'd be pleased to pleased to know. I'm not sure even government knows what we're what we're building in in terms of in terms of that. Um, so I mean, at the moment, no, there isn't formal assumptions there. But I mean, yes, you could we could all have a guess what it might what impacts it might it might bring. But I but I genuinely don't think we know, and it's not built specifically into that. But it is clearly a risk, and we're that we're uh, aware of it. I mean, in terms of contingencies, I mean, the whole reason why I was really keen that we do start off with senior officers calling in sort of service directors and executive members to talk about budgets and and what what they've got, what they're spending, what they need in advance of the budget workshop and taking that that through is really see this as an important part of the process that we're that we need to go through in the you know in the coming months to do all we can to try and see what we can do to try and generate money or find places where we can make efficiencies but let's be clear that is not going that's not going to be easy um and obviously those you know obviously colleagues here i've been particularly Particularly, I know obviously Councillor Weeks, who's been on the council rather rather longer than I have, will know how difficult some of these uh, these things are, and that's been been the case over a, a number a number of years. So, so that is a, a, a challenging process, and I cannot think of a time where there is so much uncertainty. And unfortunately, because the fact we don't even no, because the spending review was postponed and the funding review was postponed and we don't know what, whether we're going to get a replacement that is generous to us on new homes bonus and so on um it does mean that actually for us to do long-term planning is hugely difficult i wish it were otherwise that we were able we knew what our settlement was and we had and we and we had a, a position where we could seek to try and even if the money we thought the money was not as adequate as it should be we could have a good go at trying to plan what we can and can't do but at the moment we just really have a blank sheet of paper that we, we're trying to fill in quite unavailingly and it so it is beyond the i think the beyond the remit of many local authorities just to solve these problems on on their own and they will need help i think from further support uh, from government, not just because of COVID, because the the actual even even if we weren't if there hadn't been COVID, the budget wouldn't be an e dealing with the budget with a new funding system would not have been easy. And we said that last year. I said that when we moved the budget report in 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 February, and I think the medium term financial strategy sets that out again, as Ian has has just explained. So so I think yeah, we're we're absolutely clear what we what we need to try and do. We don't know whether we can actually find solutions from within our our existing budgets or in terms of forms of of income generation. But that's that's the program of work that I'm looking to make sure that we start next month and then keep on going over that over the following 12 months, so that we're in the best position we can be when we do know what maybe get a longer term look at what North Hearts Council's um, uh, funding will, will be. And of course, the other thing, just to finish off with, uh, Chair, is that is of course in, within this um, longer term period, we will we will have 
some key contracts coming up for revision. I know, Michael, it wasn't uh, so long ago. It feels like that the waste contract was <laughs> was was discussed and up, but, but it will be, you know, it will come up for review over the course of the next few years. And you know, the, we we there's another challenge in there as to whether we can get the same price and and so on. You know, on on a on that on a new contract, if if that comes up, and we, North Arts Council still exists as a as a district council at that at that at that time, you know, there will be a real there will be a real challenge there. So there's some lots of other things that are tucked away in here that we're absolutely aware of, and we will need to try and factor into the plans that we have. But it ain't easy. Thank you, Ian. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments? Yeah, I also asked a question about the um, council, the council tax base, which I think maybe Ian Cooper could reply. To oh that. yes, yeah, the base figure will not increase that assumption. Uh, Ian Cooper, could you respond to that? Yeah, um, so the main driver for that is the fact that council tax reductions would increase or stay the same as they are <coughs> currently, which is at a high level, yeah. uh, because the council tax base is made up of total profits in the district uh, assessed based on, on the banding of them. So each property has a band, um, but then you deduct essentially the, the properties that are uh, eligible for council tax reduction. So that reduces your net council tax base figure. The more you've got eligible for that support, the, the more your base goes down. So it's not so there'll be no new property in the district, it's just saying there'll be an increase in that reduction off of that for people who aren't paying council tax or aren't fully paying council tax. Um, but I suppose it's not so the local plan is wrong in terms of housing growth. It's also sort of looking at when will that growth take place as well. Uh, we're obviously in a significant economic downturn, uh, which is likely to affect uh, house builders' appetite to build new properties. And given leading time for uh, the local plan and then those houses actually being built and occupied, ready to pay council tax, it's going to be a good few years before you get to that position anyway, even with a good economy, adding a poor economy on top of that. And that's where your delay comes in too. Um, so just picking up some of the other questions what, that were asked. Uh, and I think there's a question about adequacy of, adequacy of reserves and kind of what's the plan B? Obviously, Councillor Alberts alludes to the fact that we're looking early at what the options could be, uh, but also just to note that in uh, paragraph 2.29 of the table there, uh, the forecast there is that there will be £6.4 million pounds of our general fund reserves left by the end of the period based on these assumptions. That is still above the minimum recommended level of reserves. So there is, there is wiggle room there in terms of if it's a bit worse, it can be delayed a bit more in terms of implementing those um, those savings and still you know, not, not going to crisis. Uh, but equally, you know, we do review this every year and we'll review it more than every year if we need to. Um, and therefore, if it gets even worse, there will be a need for even more drastic action that were reflected in new iterations of this strategy uh you know it does get it will get amended as and when there's more information uh but at the moment this is the best estimates we've got it's what we use to base the budget for next year on and to plan what those options could be next year uh as and when we we know more information thank you thank you ian so um all right, let's let's go to Councillor Michael Weeks for um, his questions and comments. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Ian mentioned a couple of the times that um, life is difficult for guessing what the council is going to get from central government. Uh, with respect, that's always been the case, or certainly in the last 15 years or so. We have never known what we're going to get from central government. We guess it. But usually, I think you'll find we don't get as much as we thought we were going to get. So that is nothing new, Ian. But just, just come back on that, Chair. Yeah, I mean, the, of course, Michael's absolutely right. The one thing I would say that is different this time is, is that we have got 
and government are intent on doing a full review of, of the funding formula for local authorities. So there is a new system underway. It's not just that we're tweaking it at the margins. There is a brand new system which may well take out things like new homes bonus. So the, the, you're, the, the, there's always uncertainty. You're completely right. But there is a bigger uncertainty this time because we don't know how a new funding formula might affect us and impact us in, in ways that we just don't know yet. Uh, what I would say going back is that under various headings, various monies that were given to us by central government, um, we had to guess on, on all the subject matters. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I just want to pick up um, with you, Ian Cooper, just this piece on the pay bargaining. Obviously, that was higher than expected. Um, and I'm reading it right that we had a five year forecast of 2% per year. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Yeah. And, and so now you, you've Check that around now it's 2.75 per year, which is leading to the extra half a million by 2425. Yeah. Is there other what what was there any indication coming out of pay bargaining this year around the, the likelihood of a deal next year that will last longer than just the 12 months? Uh not that I'm aware of no chair. Uh, I think it was a one-year deal, um, and it will be back. Maybe it's another one-year deal next year. Um you know, it would obviously be nice to get a longer period of, of both from the employer and the employee side, both planning for both of them. But I guess, as I've sort of mentioned previously, as it's linked to inflation and economic conditions, I guess now is not the time to be looking at what long term pay deals might look like. But it's a question, therefore, whether we're the time next year either. either. Um, so I don't know. Okay, All right, lovely. Thank you. Um, are there any further questions or comments on this? No, now's the chance. Okay, lovely. Uh, so then uh, we'll move to another vote on this because it is simpler work with us all in different locations. Uh, we will be saying to cabinet that uh, we uh, we agree that they should recommend to full council the adoption of the medium term financial strategy for 21 to 26. Uh, so if you are happy to send that to cabinet with that on, then please vote yes. If you do not want to do that, please vote no. And if you wish to abstain, please raise your hand. That's carried, Chair. Thank you very much, Matthew. Okay, so we're nearly at the end then. Um, we've got possible agenda items for future meetings. And uh, please forgive me, I don't have uh, the future agendas in front of me. Uh, Matthew, do you have uh, the forward plan in front of you? Are you able to tell us what's coming up? No, Chair, I don't have a forward plan. Um, I do have um we're just waiting for that if there is anybody that has any suggestions for things that they'd like to see on future agendas do you want to raise your hand uh councillor michael weeks oh i'm sorry i'm off the subject can i speak before you close the meeting please Chairman. Go ahead. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, can, I, can I just point out that um, I'm looking at the agenda for this meeting online as such, and the order of my, can you hear me? Yes. The order of items is completely different to what's actually occurring. Um, if the public are trying to follow this, from the agenda online, then I suggest they're struggling a little bit. We need to marry the two up. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, 
Chair, sorry to interrupt, uh, because I've had a problem uh, with my tablet. I was using the public agenda, and he's absolutely right. that I've had exactly the same problem, and I had to actually phone the, the deputy chair and ask him, Am I look has one of the items gone missing? But no, it's just been reshuffled. But it would be really helpful, um, committee services, if we could get the agenda to, to marry up with the public publicly available versions, please. Yep. I think there was a late a late adjustment due to the um, the governance statement needing to come early. So I think that's that's why uh, it's quite a rare event that that would happen. But appreciate for the public watching that this has been quite tricky to follow. Apologies for that. Um, Councillor Deacon. Oh, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I'd like us to look at a couple of things. One of them is how much has our commercial department cost us since it's set up? How much money has it made us? If it hasn't made us any money, why have we got it? And why are we only looking at a 1% return? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe that that is something that we're doing through overview and scrutiny. Um, uh, Councillor Albert, we mentioned this earlier. Do you want to speak on that, or is that not? Something? I mean, there's not, nothing I particularly want to add immediately. But, but I mean, yes, that was an issue that, that I think I think um, that you 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 raised before, Steve, didn't you, or something very similar yeah. to it. And and I thought the discussion was that this was going to be the sort of discussion between you, Chair, and the Chair of Overview and Scrutiny, whether that could be picked up in somewhat more detail at overview and scrutiny around, yeah, around those things. Yeah. Um, um, so just, just need to obviously to, you know, make sure, sure that they're my point in bring My point in bringing it up at this committee is, we are looking at not having enough money, we don't know what the future is, and reducing risk by earning money. So I think it's something that we should also be looking at. Sam Collins. Uh, I support what Councillor Deacon Davis says, actually, and I'd just like to add my permanent caveat to that is, can we have some targets, please? Yes, I would love some. That's why I asked how much you were expecting to earn. I'm just watching to see if there are any other hands going up. Um, you, you probably all know this is a, a key topic for myself as well, um, and I like to keep on top of it. Um, I do believe that this is being thoroughly looked at through overview and scrutiny, and I'm confident that that is happening, um, uh, including the inclusion of targets. I remain disappointed at the lack therein. Um, uh, let's take a vote if we want to have it at this meeting as well. Um, in terms of risk, I don't think that we've actually looked at it from a risk perspective before, and I think that that may be useful. Um, if we could ask the risk management group to look at the activity that is there um, and whether or not the expenditure on that function is now in the light of current climate and current uh, goings on, whether or not that is something that we want to look at uh, for an ongoing concern. So uh, would you be happy with that, Steve? If we take a I think that's exactly right. I think that this is an expenditure risk that shows no return and could be a bottomless pit. Okay, Ian Cooper, can you just uh, advise on how best to get that looked at? I think it's difficult to have it in two different places. Um, we can obviously report here on how much it's costing, but without the context about what they're doing and the detail around uh, the areas that are embedded in that team that are pure income generation, you've got um, so it hits your markets limited in that team and the contract there and you've got this just an estates function as well which makes it a lot of income uh, but probably isn't what you're what you're looking at in terms of your focus on commercial uh, without that context I think it'd be a, an odd report and wouldn't really give the committee what you're, what you're after um, so I think you need to uh, I think to agree with Ovian scrutiny where you want the report to go uh, by it, be it here or over in scrutiny, not to try and split it into two parts. I think that would be a mistake in terms of, as we sort of mentioned earlier in the, in the agenda, around no one looking properly at the full picture. Agreed. Okay, I, I'd like us to take a vote as to whether or not we, we dual locate this issue. Um, 
the proposal on the table uh, is that we have a scrutiny function looking at the, the, um, the cost of the commercial function and the detail of what it is that they are doing and whether or not they are being adequately uh, monitored there. And that we also ask the risk management group to look at whether or not from a, uh, a strategic level, we are uh, putting appropriate levels of spend in there. So I'd like you to vote yes if you would like to dual locate that. I'd like you to vote no if you'd like to, if you want it to remain purely an overview and scrutiny function. And I'd like you to vote abstain, which is the raise hand, uh, if you don't want to uh, have an opinion on that. That's character. Okay, so sorry, Ian. <laughs> Uh, we're going to have it in both places and we'd like the risk management group to have a look at from a strategic level whether or not our commercial function remains the right thing to do and the right, uh, uh, the right thing to press forward on. We're going to retain an overview and scrutiny level, a look at the detail of all the projects that remain in there and the KPIs that are attached to that. I'm looking to Sam Collins for a nod as my fellow commercial moany person <laughs> great okay is there anything else that anybody else would like on a future agenda uh can I just sorry i mean sorry to, I, I, I mean I'd, I'd be interested in Ian's advice on this I'm just not sure that the question you posed for the risk management group is a risk management group function but I mean I'd be obviously take Ian's advice because he chairs the risk management group but I'm not sure that I'm just not sure that is a risk management group function in the way you phrased it. Okay. Uh, if I could interrupt without you as, uh, allowing me, Madam Chairman, but you did use the word scrutiny as well. I think we're trying to tread on someone else's patch here as well. So we need to be very, very careful. Uh, Ian. Uh, so there is a risk, um, I think there's two risks that are relevant, there's a commercial risk and there's also a management the council's finances risk, uh, which are both risks and in the remit of risk management group, I mean we, we can look at that as risk management group, but that will be looking at the risk side of it, not the full picture you're looking for, which is again why I come back to you lend them a partial answer because you know, Councillor Albert is right, the risk management group is at risks, not around the nuances around risk and otherwise it would have a remit that was far too big because you can make anything a risk you want it to. Um, so have to look at the risk side of it, um, but it will be just looking at the risk side of it and may disappoint you in terms of the outcomes of it. Um, but we can do that. But the, the answer you need will be a scrutiny answer uh, looking at scrutiny of commercial. Satisfied with that, I, I believe, um, uh, and I'm in agreement with Councillor Deacon Davis, that uh, any commercial venture or commercial function of, a, of, a, uh, of an authority should begin with a full risk profile, which I've not seen uh, for, this, for the commercial venture, and it is quite some time in. And given the economic climate that we currently find ourselves in, I think that it is now prudent to make sure that we have that function looked at. And I may have used the word scrutinised, uh, there is detail to be scrutinised and overview and scrutiny of which I also um, um, am in conversation about. I think there is a high level risk that we need to have documented. And so that is the question that we'd like to go to the risk management group. Uh, Sam Collins, you had your hand up, it's gone back down. You basically said what I was going to say, Chair. The only thing I was going to add was that there is also potentially a reputational risk which should come into the council if we invest in something or got a business failed perhaps, or we invested in the wrong sort of business. I'm not sure Councillor North would approve of us investing in Holwell Nuclear Fuels Limited, for example. That's purely fictional, but you know, we, there is a potential reputational risk. So we just need to look at these in a risk sense as well, I think. And um, I think we should be willing to take the risk that we're, that, that by, in, by investigating the risk that we step on over you and scrutiny's toes when they're scrutinizing that risk. Yeah, uh, I think in, in reference to what we spoke about before around optimization of routes, uh, we were talking about something that is that is done and is now resolved. Uh, it was quite an easy decision to make. Um, I think that this is very much live 
and uh, and uh, looking at it in more than one place, I don't think can be harmful. Uh, so we voted. We'll move to that, and we'll see what we what what comes through there. And if it's not satisfactory, then we'll have another go at getting what it is that we're after. Okay. Anything else to go on a forward agenda? No. Okay. So. That just leaves me to say thank you very much, everyone, for staying with me till 10 o'clock at night um, and uh, have a lovely evening, what is left of it, and I will probably see most of you tomorrow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay.